Namaskaram. Uh, today we have a fund manager with us. Uh, he is uh, Karthik Raj Lakshmanan and uh, he is from uh, UTI uh, mutual fund, one of uh, the oldest mutual fund company in India. And uh, he got a privilege to work with uh, BNP Paribas, Baroda BNP Paribas. Uh, there he was managing task cap and consumption. And before that, uh, he was part of ICIC uh, AMC. There he was managing P, uh, PMS also. Uh, not only that, uh, he worked in G Goldman Sands also. So, he has a mixture of uh, PMS plus fund manager, then worked in an Indian company plus a foreign company. Sure. So, I am I'm really thrilled and uh, happy to host you and uh, thank you so much for you know, giving the permission to take uh, your busy schedule today when you come to Kerala. Yeah, no, thanks Nikhil <laughs> for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thank you sir. And uh, first of all, you know, I just want to tell you that uh, your name, Karthik Raj Lakshman, three yeah. names is one of my favorites. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Right. <laughs> all, yeah. all three are my favorites. Right. So, right. And uh, you, you have a Tamil background, but I right. know that it's difficult for right. you to yeah. speak. Right. But um, uh, our audience mainly understand Malayalam, right. but uh, you can right. speak uh, as yeah. you right. offered. So, yeah, first sure. we can um, start with uh, talking about a bit of introduction, how is your education, and then how you get right. into fund management. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm, uh, like you mentioned, I'm a Tamilian, uh, but uh, most of my schooling and education has been in Bombay. Uh, so, I've done my uh, BCom uh, Chartered Accountancy and uh, PGDBM from SPJMR Bombay and have cleared uh, CFA as well. Uh, from a career perspective, uh, I've had a short stint with ICIC Bank post CA before MBA. But uh, post that, like you said, Goldman Sachs, uh, I was in Bangalore uh, supporting the US uh, research team. Oh, okay. And uh, post that, I moved to uh, ICIC Prudential uh, on the PMS side, uh, assisting the fund managers on the research side. Oh, okay. And uh, majority of my time has been in uh, BNP, where I've spent close to 14 years there. Um, I have uh, been on the PMS side, uh, managed funds on that side, uh, looked at quite a few sectors. And uh, uh, for uh, five, six years, I was on the mutual fund side, handling the large cap consumption and uh, hybrid fund, aggressive hybrid fund. Uh, UTI mutual fund, I moved uh, about uh, almost uh, two years back. Uh, so, uh, I'm handling the uh, large cap fund here and uh, the MNC fund. Okay, okay. Yeah. that's nice. GS, uh, which was here you, you worked there? Uh, 2006. 2006, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that time I was also there in Bangalore. Oh, great. <laughs> you were in Embassy Gold Fund. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah. I was in, uh, uh, next to Manipal, there was Aram said, uh, right. Uh, right. I was there. Oh, great. <laughs> we <laughs> so did we meet at that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's good, right. that's good, interesting. Okay. Right. So, sir, uh, you know, you, you uh, worked in uh, GS, then you moved to, uh, you know, Indian uh, fund management side. Right. So, when did you really realize that, uh, when you worked in, uh, uh, GS kind of a place. Right. And this is your area and how did you kind of get into there? Right. I think that thought came in uh, during B-school time. Uh, anyways, I have had uh, liking for numbers and uh, during uh, B-school quite a few of our friends, uh, we used to uh, uh, kind of look at markets actively and uh, like the uh, corporate valuation subject as such. Uh, so, the seeds were sown at that time, so that's okay. why I uh, actively scouted for a job in the uh, uh, markets and that's where I first moved to the sell side. Uh, okay. uh, so, it was a support function for the US equity team. But uh, when I uh, got the opportunity to move to a front office and that too on the asset management side, I uh, just wanted to grab that. Uh, so, I think uh, the first seeds probably was uh, somewhere in the B school. B school, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, the CFA and everything, uh, right. you have studied uh, while you are working? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, when I was completing my uh, PGDBM, along with that, I just uh, started this and uh, along with work, I cleared it. Yeah, yeah. Because if you are there in this field, uh, CFA uh, helps, so yeah. that's where I cleared yeah, yeah, yeah. it. And I, I was uh, really impressed. Uh, Impressed and a bit of a jealousy also. So, how how you kind of, uh, whenever I look at any fund managers, I can right. see that uh, the right. kind of degrees which uh, right. you guys uh, go through, uh, you know, right. really impressive. Right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, normally when we, in, in Kerala, we have a, 
uh, you know tendency of uh, youngsters who right. are really coming into trading right uh, and uh, uh, and we have uh, so much of uh, trading going on we right. have a, uh, it's not just a, we are talking about demat and trading account we right. have a, forex we have a uh, True. Uh, crypto and everything let's not right. talk about uh, crypto right. and uh, forex but uh, right. trading as a as a as a career uh, right. or trading as a real uh, serious into trading right. what is your take on that sir right no uh, the data speaks for itself i mean even the regulator and uh, many people have uh, kind of uh, shown the data that it's a very small portion of uh, traders who actually make money uh, so uh, from that perspective uh, the vast majority should not be thinking that i will also be successful at that uh, so uh, i think the skills required for that are quite different even i mean uh, what we do is completely a long term investing uh, so we would not be able to comprehend fully what happens on the trading side so our view is uh, even when we buy a stock or build the portfolio the thought process is to uh, look at it from a 5 10 and even 20 year dcfs that we do okay, okay. Uh, so whereas uh, trading would require very different uh, skill sets and uh, uh the data does show that very few people actually eventually succeed in that. Okay, okay. so you mentioned that 20 year dcs right. you do so right. can you with elaborate and see that how right. easy and difficult is to do that right <laughs> right uh, so no it is and uh, importance of doing that right <laughs> right uh, so if we understand basically when we are buying a stock even for a minute basically what we are buying is the promise of that particular company of all the cash flows that it will uh, create for the minority shareholders in the future i mean the future being infinite but lot of value comes from the immediate 20 30 years uh, so that's where we need to see i mean what is the kind of uh, growth in the cash flows how much needs to be reinvested in the business and how much can be uh, uh, returned back to the shareholders so uh, as a um, uh, shareholder uh, the cash that you get back as a buyback or a dividend is what you are really uh, working for so dcf tries to capture this only i mean the particular company what is the kind of top line growth what's the profit growth what will be the uh, eventual free cash flow from that and uh, what is my uh, capital cost or what is the return rate that i expect from that business so with that we will discount it and whatever is the value that gives us whether the current price is reflecting a fair value is it undervalued or is it overvalued obviously there are a lot of uh, assumptions but at the same time you need to have uh, some basis to identify whether a stock is overvalued or undervalued so that's why we uh, try to uh, standardize and have an approach of looking at uh, companies from a longer term view okay so all this information are studied and in well informed decision not right. just like a taking a tip and buying it so right <laughs> not, i know that uh, right. uh, you won't do it but right. the po- point is that uh, here yeah. uh, so called traders and investors right. are mainly depending on uh, any uh, news uh, websites or any any tip from any anyone right right so that is a uh, so there uh, the market information i mean whatever data is available to everyone probably that gets factored in in the market price immediately right okay. i mean we have to some extent i mean whether you will have an edge based on that is something which is questionable i mean what we believe is if you can identify a good company which can have good return ratios and good growth Uh, based on that uh, you will uh, create wealth through compounding i mean the okay. earnings uh, keeps going up the dividends keep going up and the stock price eventually will keep going up is the basis on which you can uh, evaluate a company and purchase it okay okay on number basis you kind of get a confidence right you can really depend on that right. future uh, right. maybe t- 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 True. 20 years right and you need to keep eva it's a continuous process you need to keep evaluating it on a day on a probably we discuss it quite frequently every quarterly results and so on uh, so it's not a one time exercise and you forget it you keep on updating and seeing where what estimates you had and how it is changing probably you expected to grow at x actual turns out to be y y could be higher lower whichever so then you kind of remodel and say okay the fair value could be different so it's a continuous process like i said i mean it's a, a guiding a path i mean you will not get the exact answer but at least it's a guiding path as to uh, whether you are in the right direction and the stock does hold value okay okay, okay. 
So, it, the simple thing is that it's not that uh, taking a buying call for a stock, it's right. not just uh, that uh, somebody told you and you've taken the decision. It's, it's right. purely based on right. uh, uh, numbers and uh, deep study. So, True. to pick one stock, how many days you will take? No, no uh, so it's a team effort we have uh, on the equity time side itself, uh, close to 24, 25 people. It's a large team. Uh, so, the, we have sector analysts, uh, some of them supporting them and we have a uh, handful of fund, fund managers as well interacting with the analysts. So, it's uh, entirely a team effort. It's not like just one person working on particular idea. Obviously, the sector analyst will pr uh, primarily work on that idea, but it is uh, eventually discussed in the entire team and uh, then the opinion is formed and whether uh, the company can be uh, made part of the universe or not is decided. Right. But you know, I know that it's a team, team world, I understand. Mm -hmm. So the point is that, what is that life cycle? Right. One idea kind of picked and uh, how, what, when that stock is kind of uh, uh, you know, ended into your portfolio. Right. A, a new company, uh, we would even uh, kind of evaluate at times for uh, two, three quarters how uh, it is uh, behaving and whether our assumptions, especially if it is a new sector, we will try to uh, get uh, new, new data points and uh, how the sector and the company move. Uh, whereas if it is an existing uh, sector and uh, well-known sector, probably it could take much shorter time even 15-20 uh, days. Uh, we do evaluate IPOs as well for some of the funds. There obviously the time frame you get is uh, often uh, shorter. I mean from the time you, you get to meet the management and evaluate it probably it's all in the range of one to two months at max. Uh, so, uh, that, but when you want to kind of get that uh, confirmation and confidence in the company, you need to keep evaluating it and looking at it from a longer period of time. Uh, so, quite a lot of our uh, heavy weights we would be tracking for years together I mean, as a team. Okay. So, you mentioned about IPO. Right. Uh, IPO, it's a, these days a lot of IPOs are coming and a lot of people are applying and, uh, right. and everyone have a belief that IPO is a cheaper and uh, right. you get it, uh, uh, you know, and you can really make a big money out of it. Right. So what's your take on uh, looking for IPOs just like an IPO company, I, I right. want to buy. Right. right. That, what's your take on this? Right. <laughs> so again here, uh, the data suggests that uh, it's not like majority of the IPOs do eventually uh, well. I mean, the real test is that if you uh, see uh, three, five years out post the listing, how the company has fared is the real uh, uh, kind of test. But there, uh, the number of companies which are actually doing well is on the minority side. Uh, so to that extent, uh, caution is definitely warranted while uh, evaluating IPO because like I said, uh, you hardly meet the companies for once or twice and uh, have limited uh, uh, data on the company and uh, to that extent, uh, uh, the information available is limited. Uh, so, once it gets listed and a uh, few quarters pass by, you really get to know uh, the nuances of the business and the company and management and so on. Uh, so, I would say, I mean, one has to be very uh, selective, especially from a longer term perspective. Uh, initially, uh, the IPO listing gains may not be what we would want to look at because when we buy, it's obviously from a longer term perspective. The institutions will not necessarily be buying it to kind of sell it on the first day or so. So the idea is to kind of hold it on for longer and uh, from that perspective uh, uh, you need to evaluate whether it has the potential from a longer term perspective. Where we are uh, not very clear probably we will have little lesser exposure and would want to kind of evaluate it over a period of time. Uh, but uh, to kind of summarize I would say the strike rate is lower, it is not like all the companies okay. which IPO do really very well. Yeah, we have that uh, tendency especially when the market is doing good, everyone right. wants IPO. Right. Uh, that, so, right. Uh, that is something which so, uh, we have to uh, right. work on it. Right. And the same thing, uh, when it comes to uh, NFO, I think, I, I don't know, I should be asking this question <laughs> to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, the NFO, we right. have a tendency to look for is NFO is only 10 rupees. And it's, right. a, it's like right. a big lucky thing for us. Right. So, uh, when someone is looking for an IPO as an investor right. to invest, right. uh, 
what is your take? Because especially we have similar funds available in the market. Right. right. And in what state, an right. investor, for example, you as an investor, right. will look for an NFO. Right. No, uh, clearly I think uh, there are funds, We even in our uh, entire bouquet of funds, we have funds which we call as core funds. We'll have something which is a uh, satellite and we have uh, sector funds as well. So the idea from a fund house perspective is to kind of complete the bouquet because the investor's need can be very uh, different. I mean, you could have an investor who is uh, on the riskier side and who would say, I would want to have all my exposure in mid and small cap. You could have a very conservative investor who would say, I would probably put it in more uh, uh, balanced or a hybrid kind of a uh, fund. Uh, someone who believes tactically uh, for the next one, two years a particular sector is looking good may want to go for that. So from a fund house perspective, it is kind of uh, uh, filling the entire uh, uh, offering is what uh, they would want to look at. The investor has to evaluate their uh, risk appetite, uh, their uh, career goals and based on that they have to choose. And each fund house and each fund manager may have a particular style saying that I will be growth, I will be more of a blend or value and so on. So the investor has to uh, see through that as well and oh. uh, based on that one has to choose. It's not again like every NFO has to be kind of yeah. looked at. Basically understand and, uh, right. and you you uh, uh, written a blog or I think some uh, interview, I, I, right. I was reading that the risk, right. you spoke about risk, right. investor risk and investment right. risk right. and you mentioned that uh, how an investor you know, behave in a certain way. Right. And what are that risk which is associated? Because we have a, a right. tendency of uh, listening any right. mutual fund advertisement. Right. A mutual fund investment is subject to market risk. Right. But uh, if you look at FD, you don't have anything like right. that. Right. Right. But uh, if I put that FD in a local bank. Right. Uh, actually speaking, there is also risk associated. Exactly. But right. that is not really often right. uh, talk right. about it or right. it's not a mandatory rule. True. <laughs> so, true. So what is your take on what is that uh, uh, subject to market risk uh, right. investing in mutual funds? Right. Hey, uh, no, I think uh, uh, there are uh, multiple parameters. Clearly, when you look at an any asset class, I mean, broadly, if we take uh, all four asset class, when you say uh, say fixed income, equities, real estate, or gold, uh, four large asset classes, each of the asset class would have uh, some dimension of risk and reward. Uh, any asset, I mean, uh, typically you would say that if the return expectations are higher, probably the risk associated with that would be higher. I mean, the, that's the kind of correlation that you're looking at. The example that you gave clearly in a FT, the risk may be lower. I mean, whatever little risk that the bank uh, still uh, doesn't go bankrupt or uh, stays uh, uh, a going concern, uh, that's a small risk. I mean, uh, it can happen, but that's a small risk. And the returns there are also far more measured because it's clearly certain. Uh, if you go to equities on the other extreme, uh, I mean the returns can be very high. For example, in the last one year, the kind of returns that you've seen in a mid cap or a small cap uh, index, uh, it can be uh, quite unimaginable as well. But at the same time, the risk is that there can be a, a drawdown. For example, uh, instead of last year, if the investor invested the money, say in January 20, within a matter of three months, uh, they could have seen a 35-40% drawdown on their NAV. Uh, that is the real uh, risk. I mean, you should be ready to see your uh, wealth, uh, at least temporarily, going down because of whatever external factors, which is difficult for any of us to fathom or forecast. Uh, but eventually what we see is that uh, the markets eventually uh, work in line with the uh, earnings potential of the underlying companies. So, so as long as the companies are able to generate uh, uh, income and distribute it as dividends, uh, the stock prices will eventually go up. There may be a lead or lag, but eventually they will uh, go up and uh, to that extent you can say that okay, longer term, yes, uh, the uh, returns will come back. But I can't say for sure that it will not go down. So that going down is the risk that you are looking at. And that's where the investor's behavior becomes very important. When the uh, markets go down 20-30%, the investor should not panic and say, okay, it will further correct. I want to at least salvage whatever value is left. So I will uh, withdraw at that time. 
and that's where the behavior comes to the fore i mean you have to if possible at that time add further uh, to kind of uh, increase the exposure because uh, the valuations have become attractive if you don't have liquidity or whatever in a, your um, overall asset allocation you can't have more room for adding equity probably at least you hold on and the last thing you should be doing is at that point in time panic and kind of uh, get this money out so that's where the investors need to be far more informed uh, the behavioral aspect becomes far more important for the average investor fund manager anyone who is dealing with the uh, markets so uh, basically the learning i can take is that uh, uh, when we uh, talk about risk it is more of a volatility or volatility uh, exactly yeah. that fluctuation right in fd no one is talking about fluctuation right. it's fixed and you will exactly right but in equd right the risk is right thing but your uh, volatility and right can you play around with it exactly <laughs> right <laughs> so, yeah uh, uh, can you uh, uh, do you have the appetite yeah. to uh, bear that volatility yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's uh, I, i mean you need to have the investment horizon clear in your mind and you should be ready to bear the volatility uh, through that investment period okay but that uh, holding on to the Uh, or identifying into the correct uh, product and uh, holding on to that right. throughout the journey is a uh, important thing okay. i think that that's where a lot of gold based investing really come to right. into play right and, and sir uh, you have a uh, i think kartik is fine here yeah. <laughs> right yeah uh, see i am i'm looking from a uh, because uh, this is uh, it's an opportunity to sit with you as a <laughs> student and learn <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, here the, the point is uh, you have uh, had an opportunity to manage a bms right and uh, you are now working in uh, mutual fund so you are right. in both the worlds right, right. and uh, we have a tendency that a bms is better than this one or bms is uh, have an opportunity to get right. more fund there are many things right. so can you compare both this and uh, uh, i'm sure that you can talk right. about both in a, right uh, right unbiased <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely definitely <laughs> yeah please so, uh, so uh, uh, the difference is largely in the ticket size ticket itself size. where it starts i mean the pms ticket size aif ticket size are in the 50 lakh 1 crore uh, kind of a one whereas mutual funds you could have uh, as small as uh, 5000 as well uh, so that's why the ticket sizes are quite different and obviously the way from operations perspective the way they are managed are a little different uh, in pms you would have uh, directly into the tmat account of the investor the transactions are made whereas here it is in the uh, fund house and the scheme level and then the unit holders just get the nav at the end of the day uh, so those are the operational differences but from a thought process perspective uh, from a, a fund management there may not be a very different approach i mean as long as it is like to like apple to apple comparable i mean if you have a, a large cap pms and a large cap fund uh, the way you would want to kind of manage both of them would be uh, largely similar other than for uh, probably some of this uh, operational aspects and uh, uh, the ticket size so to that extent the end goal uh, at the uh, end of the day is that you try to maximize the uh, returns for the investor uh, within the uh, set guard rails i mean you should not be going uh, outside the guard rails because then you will be taking unnecessary risk within those guard rails or uh, risk parameters you uh, try to uh, achieve the goal return uh, goal okay okay that's good that's good so when when we speak about uh, fund houses right. as such, uh, this is an indian fund house and you right. worked in a international right. uh, fund house also right. i'm sure that bnp culture gs right. is more of a you right. are supporting to the US, right. uh, fund house but right. what is the difference between right. uh, how we manage and foreign uh, institutions manage Uh, no i mean the team has been entirely uh, local and uh, we've managed it the same way i mean all, all the mutual funds uh, the regulator is same the approach is entirely same uh, the way you look at it i mean the culture obviously uh, would be different from organization to organization that was a much smaller organization while this is a, a huge uh, organization the oldest uh, of the mutual funds uh, so that way uh, those differences come through and uh, uti clearly i mean the brand itself uh, the recall is uh, quite strong uh, okay. so that's a big advantage yeah yeah, yeah. and and uh, this one uh, when we speak about your fund i'm talking about large cap as a fund right. 
Last year, we have a lot of argument like we have passive funds also True. coming in. True. And uh, we have a question that uh, should right. I go for active fund or should I right. go for ETF uh, passively right. managed? Right. So, and uh, what is that uh, as an investor or as a distributor, right. I should be learning and uh, right. uh, help my uh, you know, right. set of investors? Sure. Uh, so, passives, uh, we also have a large uh, passive setup at Tute as mm -hmm. well. I mean, uh, they could fulfill, I mean, uh, from some institutions uh, would uh, have to go through the passive route, someone tactically for a short term, they want to have some exposure particular sector or some uh, particular theme, uh, passives would help. Uh, now comparing uh, large cap versus uh, passive fund, uh, and this discussion has come up in the last few years uh, because uh, the active fund managers were not able to beat the benchmark. Uh, I think it was uh, specific to this 4-5 years. In the long term, the uh, funds have been able to create alpha. I mean, as long as the funds are able to create alpha over a benchmark, uh, I mean, it is always uh, the actives would have uh, better uh, opportunity or uh, the larger AEM should actually reside in the uh, active side. Uh, only um, if there was doubts about uh, whether uh, the active fund management or active uh, funds would be able to beat the benchmark, then uh, the passives come into discussion. Uh, like I said, I mean, last four or five years was highlighted. Uh, I mean, uh, this was the period when, uh, say, uh, uh, especially 2018 to 20, when select few companies, uh, index companies were doing well. If we uh, see during this time, the mutual funds. Uh, uh, flows passive AEM also from almost nothing uh, moved up to 30 plus percent. Uh, so that itself meant buying more of the index names. Okay. So that was a period where uh, some of the active funds have underperformed. But over a longer period of time, uh, I still believe there is opportunity even in the large cap category to create alpha. Okay. And to that extent, the actives uh, should uh, still be there for a longer term investor, uh, okay. uh, investor with a 5-10 year kind of a horizon. Okay, okay. I think, it, you know, these days a lot of people are thinking long time. Uh, right. And uh, then True. they come and uh, then when they build a portfolio, they are right. really mindful. Right. Uh, along with the large cap, right. they want to have a mid and right. small also. That, right. that way, a lot of diversification happens. But some diversification is a problem. Right. Because, uh, a lot of people are thinking that small cap is giving me like a 30 plus uh, percentage right. of return. Right. And a lot of people are investing in the uh, small cap. Right. And the only diversification they are doing is, right. uh, instead of uh, uh, keeping only one small cap, yeah. right. they will buy multiple funds of small cap. Right. They think that that is right. diversification. Right. Right. I, I, I yeah. think that… Uh, right. Uh, yeah. You won't have any <laughs> right, right. agreement with that. Right? Exactly. So, clearly, when you have multiple uh, small cap funds, uh, it could be that you are diversifying too much and if you probably combine all the portfolios together, the number of stocks in the combined portfolio that you are buying would be very uh, large and often uh, there are chances that it may even reflect uh, the index. So, in a way, uh, probably when you diversify too much, uh, the advantage is kind of lost like you said. Uh, so, that is where probably uh, one needs to have uh, limited exposure depending on their risk appetite and their time horizon as to which style would suit me and which fund will suit me. I mean, too much diversification, whether in particular small cap category or overall may not really help the investor. And you are managing sectoral fund, uh, fund right. uh, right. thematical fund also, MNC, right. uh, MNC right. fund. So, uh, you know, first of all, uh, when you say MNC, right. uh, what is the definition of MNC? Is it that right. income we should come from uh, there or company right. is uh, right. uh, international? I have seen the right. portfolio. So, right. so that way people also can understand. Right. Right. And who are the kind of a uh, set of clients right. should come into uh, right. Thematical uh, right. funds. Right. Uh, so, MNC, uh, the fund follows the uh, uh, NSE uh, MNC index where uh, the definition is uh, the promoter has to be foreign. Uh, so, that is what we follow uh, in our uh, approach as well. I mean, the promoter has to be uh, foreign. I mean, so that is where you will have. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, international companies, uh, Indian subsidiaries which are listed here uh, being part of the portfolio. 
the advantage of uh, MNC as a category is one that uh, the commonality is since they generally tend to have a strong parent uh, uh, and good on technology, so the technology transfer happens uh, uh, seamlessly and the balance sheets are generally strong. Uh, they generate uh, healthy cash flows and they are conservative, often the governance standards are very high. Uh, so th these are some of the commonalities that you find. And while it is thematic, the good part about this is that it is diversified into multiple sectors. So we have MNC companies uh, from healthcare, uh, FMCG, industrials, auto, um, uh, financials, IT. So it's almost like a very well diversified uh, one. The commonality just being that it should be a MNC uh, promoter. Uh, so, the universe may be little smaller, uh, but like I said, I'm generally uh, as a group, they tend to have better cash flows, better return ratios, often asset light, uh, maybe uh, because the parent uh, provides uh, some of the technical know-how and so on. Uh, so, uh, that way, this is a good category for uh, our satellite allocation, like I said, I mean, a core allocation still we believe. Uh, one should look at a large or a flexi or a multi-cap uh, kind of an approach. Whereas uh, uh, on the satellite side, uh, some of these thematic uh, can be a part of the uh, portfolio. Yeah, it's, it's good. Uh, it's more like a uh, global uh, uh, thinking operating right. in a local way. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> so that way, right. this one uh, right. can give a kind true. of a, Right. Uh, right. Definitely, we have seen uh, companies like Tata Motors and all uh, right. really uh, uh, just mentioning the name. It's right. not a investor. Right. Or a right. Investor yeah. Example. In the particular, I mean, uh, the definition has to be the promoter has to yeah. be foreign. Yeah. I mean, uh, the entity that is owning the company has to be uh, from foreign. From, yeah. foreign. From outside. Yeah. 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 That, that's that's good. Right. And so when, when we uh, we spoke about uh, you know uh, many other things. And as an investor, uh, what is uh, if I'm a new person to invest in? Hmm. Uh, what is the kind of a start they right. can uh, take into investing in a, a capital market? Right, right. No, uh, so again, going back to basics, I mean, the whole purpose of investing is, I mean, you want to grow the uh, money and eventually get the uh, career, uh, the financial goals that you have set for yourself and get the financial freedom. Uh, broadly, I mean the, the four asset classes, different uh, risks and ret uh, return parameters. What we have seen is among these four asset classes from a longer term perspective, equities is easily investable even in very small uh, amounts and uh, from a longer term perspective, the returns have been good if we take the last 20-30 years. Um, uh, for the uh, investor, I mean nothing new that I am going to say but just repeating what uh, many of your uh, uh, past participants would have said, I mean uh, clearly uh, the earlier you start it is better and uh, uh, if you have that investing discipline right from the beginning and invest uh, uh, with a, a goal in mind and with a risk appetite in mind, it always uh, helps. And asset allocation is something very important. I mean, probably uh, yeah, when uh, when an investor is young, probably she can uh, have lot more investments into equities. But uh, as they clo go closer to retirement, maybe uh, the shift can happen to more uh, kind of a fixed income uh, okay. part as well. Uh, so it's uh, individual uh, specific depending on their uh, horizon of investing and their uh, risk appetite and their uh, saving surplus that they can create every uh, month. But uh, nonetheless, uh, you start earlier the better and you have proper asset allocation to all asset classes that always helps. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, the lesson is that uh, start early, be right. disciplined. Right. And uh, importantly, uh, even if you are choosing a company, right. Right. You should be looking at the unique features of the company and based right. on that investment. Right. And at the same right. time, if you are investing as an investor, right. understand me very clearly. Right. Right. Uh, based on that touch on any right. Uh, right. asset class have their own behavior. Yeah, yeah. Only thing is right. that we need to understand who we are. Exactly. Investing. That is okay. true. That is true. Just to add, for example, I mean, 
जस्ट लुकिंग एट लास्ट वन और टू इयर्स द रिटर्न्स हैव बीन वेरी एक्स्ट्रा एक्स्ट्रा ऑर्डनरीली हाई एंड यू एक्सपेक्ट दैट दिस विल रिपीट ईयर आफ्टर ईयर मे बी दैट्स अ वेरी फॉल्स ग्राउंड टू स्टार्ट विथ राइट आई मीन इवेंचुअली लाइक आई सेड इट ऑल बॉइल्स डाउन टू वॉट इज दी अर्निंग्स ग्रोथ पोटेंशियल ऑफ द कंपनी और द मार्केट एज अ होल एंड इफ यू आर हियर फ्रॉम अ फाइव टेन ईयर परस्पेक्टिव यू वुड बी यू शुड बी लुकिंग एट दैट नंबर रादर दैन लुकिंग एट लास्ट वन ईयर और टू ईयर हाई नंबर एंड से ओके आई शुड बी लुकिंग एट अ ट्वेंटी फाइव थर्टी परसेंट कंपाउंडिंग फॉर एवर दैट मे नॉट नेसरली वर्क आई मीन प्रॉपली यू शुड हैव मोर मेशर्ड नंबर और एक्सपेक्टेशन एंड अ लॉन्गर टर्म हर एस Thank you so much, sir. No, uh, it's a, it's a great uh, 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 pleasure, uh, uh, you know, sitting with you and uh, uh, talking. And I think there are quite uh, many things I learned. I'm sure that uh, uh, so many things to be discussed more. <laughs> But you know, I think sure. this is uh, good enough. And uh, people who are listening to this set of uh, this interview, right. they will gain a lot. Right. I feel I I, uh, oh, you know, yeah. I I have gained it, right. and uh, this will help um, you know uh, to uh, to educate people in Kerala. Correct. and the uh, audience of uh, this yeah. uh, this this particular channel yeah. uh, to come into market at the same time um, they will come with an information that this is what it is can right. expect that there is a risk also right. and uh, i need to understand what is my risk profile based on that they can come and invest right so thank you so much sir uh, no, any thanks. final comment uh, for uh, uh, no i mean uh, i think you're doing a great job helping uh, all the youngsters uh, not just in kerala all over uh, whosoever is watching this uh, so i mean uh, all the best to you and thanks for having me on the show and all the best uh, to your uh, viewers you asked me to uh, add little bit of malayalam malayalam <laughs> arilla <laughs> so, so, i i understand but uh, not so well versed with uh, malayalam yeah, I, I communicating yeah. and sir this is uh, your your fund uh, people who hold the uh, units right. they all gained it okay. and there were cases where when the market was down people mm-hmm. were upset and uh, you right. know uh, asking for exit and all but uh, there are quite number of people who have really waited and uh, have right. really got the fruit right yeah thank you Great. so much sir thank oh, thanks you. thanks thank you thanks namaskar namaskar thank you